Our guest today is a founding dean and executive director of Arupe College. He was ordained a Jesuit priest nearly 20 years ago. His book, Come to Believe, How the Jesuits Are Reinventing Education Again, was published in June. The book serves as both a reflection and a memoir that focuses on the first year of Arupe College. Prior to arriving in Chicago, our guest today served as the Associate Dean of the School of Education at the University of San Francisco and served as President of Loyola Jesuit High School in New York City. He earned his doctorate from Columbia University Teachers College in Organizational Leadership. Ladies and gentlemen, Father Steve Katsoros. Dr. Father. Good morning, everyone. Great to uh, be with you, very caffeinated this morning. A, a special thank you to uh, President Rooney and all of my colleagues uh, at Loyola University who are with us. Also, uh, our Provost John Pellicero, as Jay said, his classmate from Marquette. Uh, also, I'm always grateful and moved to uh, see my brother Jesuits, you know, we Jesuits. The line of the gospel is see how they love one another with the Jesuits to see how they shove one another. But, uh, you know, they clean up well and uh, we show up for each other. Uh, very grateful for, for Jay Doherty. You know, when I first moved to Chicago in 2014, I was told, listen, you're new here and you don't know anything about Chicago or Illinois. You've got to start going to those lunches at the City Club. Connect with Jay Doherty. And so he welcomed me and uh, I've been... Uh, attending these since the fall of 2014. It's funny, so a year ago, I was flying back from a wedding in New York and I had Wi-Fi on the plane. Ed Mazur and I were just talking about this. And all of a sudden, it was unbelievable that Paul Michael Green had passed away. You know, I still miss him, the chairman of, of the City Club. But it's so great to see so many City Club friends with us uh, this morning. So Arupe College uh, is a new initiative at, Arupe, at Loyola University. And I'm going to walk you through a bunch of slides. So there is our first class that graduated last month. A uh, great day in the history of Jesuit higher ed. You've got uh, Andres and uh, Bernice and Sergio. I'm really so proud of these students. You know, I mean, they pioneered this school with us. I mean, they took a risk on a program when they were applying for us. They were applying to a college that didn't even exist yet. So. You know, that was really quite uh, daring of them at a place called Arupe. Well, so who's Arupe? Father Pedro Arupe, you know, Jay just mentioned this. He coined the phrase, and anyone who's been to a Jesuit high school or college or university uh, in the last 35 years knows that, you know, the goal of a Jesuit education is to become a woman or man for and with others. And Father Arupe said that he was the superior general of the Jesuits in the 60s, 70s, and 80s. He died in 1991. And he was talking to some Jesuit alumni, some fat cat donors back in the 70s. And he said, listen, thank you very much for uh, your goodness to us. Thank you for your generosity. But if you're not using your talent and your training for others, particularly those in the margins, we have not served you well. We blew it. We failed in our mission with you. We want you to be, and the schools were all single sex and all, all male, we want you to be men for others. And so he gave us our battle cry. Now, this lecture of mine, or President presentation is called How the Jesuits Are Reinventing Education. It's really, you know, a handful of Jesuits. And it's really much more uh, a, a squadron legion of, of, of lay women and lay men who are talented and tireless and who believe in this mission. And Arupe College, this college, a two-year program for students from low-income backgrounds of who are first gen to go to college, this is part of a 45-year progression that began on 
the Lower East Side. Yeah, here we go. Uh, the Lower East Side of Manhattan. So I worked here in the 80s. I think I'm in this picture somewhere. This is a tenement on Forsyth Street. In the 1970s, a handful of Jesuits and uh, several lay people began the Nativity Movement. This is a middle school for kids from low income backgrounds that could never afford to go to a, a private school. And they were in District 1. At that time, District 1, the public schools in New York, were underperforming and underserving these young people. This was the first one. There are over 50 of these nativity schools now, including Chicago Jesuit Academy uh, here in our city. So that was in the 1970s that the first nativity school opened. Now we have Cristo Rey. All right, my, my friends from Cristo Rey are here. The very first one, and they're represented today, opened in Pilsen in 1996. Best story in Catholic secondary ed, how students are offsetting their tuitions by working uh, in corporate settings one day a week. And uh, the first one, as I said, opened in Pilsen 21 years ago. There are now over 30 of these Cristo Rey schools. So you can sort of see where this is going. We have the middle schools with the Jesuits and our colleagues in the 70s. And then we've got the high schools with LA women and men and Jesuits in the 90s. So now it's time for higher ed. And you know, in higher ed, we're wringing our hands because we're all saying, you know, we're leaving a lot of people behind, particularly the Jesuit schools. There are 28 Jesuit colleges and universities. If any of you are parents and you're paying tuitions, thank you, we appreciate that. But we know that for so many folks, they can't afford a Jesuit education. So how can we create this opportunity for deserving and talented young women and young men to experience what others experience? Let me give you some numbers first about two-year program. So uh, back in my hometown, 9% uh, of those who go to city colleges graduate uh, in two years' time. Nationally, 5% of those who go to two-year colleges graduate in two years' time. These are not great numbers, obviously. And then 28% graduate in, in three years' time. Here in Chicago, I was at the City Club, I guess it was last year before she um, transitioned out of her role as, as Chancellor, Cheryl Hyman of the City Colleges said that 17%, and this was an improvement, 17% of those enrolled in City Colleges uh, graduated. And now we have Juan Salgado, great op-ed in the New York Times from Juan Salgado, the Chancellor of our City Colleges here. All right, so these numbers are um, need improvement. Some more numbers. Back in New York, 60% of the students who uh, enroll in city colleges there need to take remedial math before they can move on. And 70% never complete the remedial math course. So they don't earn their associate's degrees. They are forever stuck. And then here's something that's really striking to me. City colleges in Chicago, New York, around the country, they're overwhelmed with enrollment and they're under-resourced in many cases. Many heroic people working there. But students meet with their academic advisor once. Not once a semester, not once a year, once during the entire course of enrollment. And these are students who are first gen, who may not be well versed in, ter in terms of how to navigate the system of a large city, university, or college settings. So what are the Jesuits and uh, our lay colleagues uh, going to do with this data? Well, what we've done is Arupe College. So if any of you are Loyola Law School grads, you might know this building. This is McGuire Hall on the corner of Pearson and State, all right? Built around uh, 40 years ago. The law schools moved down the street. Then it was the business school about 10 years ago. They've moved uh, across the street uh, this past year. Now this is the setting for um, Arupe College. You know, what's with the Jesuits and real estate? I mean, here we are on the Gold Coast. My father, you know, Jay mentioned I worked at Loyola School in New York. So my address forever was 980 Park Avenue on the Upper East Side. And um, my phone number was Butterfield 8, 3588. <laughs> my father said to me, your address is 980 Park Avenue. Your phone number is Butterfield 8. Steve, if this is your, your vow of poverty, bring on, bring on chastity. <laughs> so here is our mission statement. 
So Arupe is a two-year college of Loyola that's continuing the Jesuit tradition of making liberal arts available to a diverse population who are first in their families to go on to higher ed. Uh, an affordable uh, and accessible model uh, that practices care of personalities, care for the whole person intellectually, morally, and spiritually. Our students will get associate's degrees and go on to BA programs or on to jobs. And heeding the work, thank you very much, of, uh, of Father Rupe being persons for others. So, what we're looking for from Arupe uh, students. Our average GPA is 2.8. That's a B, B minus. Our average ACT coming from high school is a 17. These are students that can do college, but they need more support. And they would never get into a selective, competitive uh, university like Loyola and get a scholarship with a 2.8 or a 17. So how can we make a Jesuit higher education available to them? Well, for one thing, if they're commuters, then they're not paying for room and board. And that location, Pearson and State, right by Chicago and State. All of our students, as I said, are first gen. And here are some uh, more numbers for you. So 73% of our students this year are Latino, 22% African American, 20% are undocumented, 59% are female, 42% uh, uh, are graduates of CPS high schools, 25% are graduates of Catholic high schools, and 33% are uh, uh, graduates of Chicago's charter high schools. This is Loyola's gift to the city of Chicago. Our tuition is $18,713, so comparable to Sacred Heart schools. Uh, <laughs> but how do we, sorry about that, Nat, I'm on Nat's board, he's doing a great job. Um, how do we make this available when 61% of our students, their families, their expected family contribution is zero? We are working with very economically challenged uh, students and their families. So all of our students apply, who are our citizens, all who are eligible, uh, submit their free application for federal student aid. We want our students to have some skin in the game, and so they contribute anywhere between $700 and $1,200, $1,300 towards their tuition of that $18,000. If they qualify for Pell Grants and for MAP Grants, that's $10,000 that is gone with the wind from that $18,000. And then Loyola and Arupe and I uh, fundraise the rest. I want to tell you about some of the influences on our work at Arupe. If you haven't read this book, uh, Paul Tuff owes me, but this is really a great book. It's called How Children Succeed. He writes about our demographic here in Chicago in the Roseland section, also in San Francisco and, and New York. So Paul Tuff called me uh, one time, area code 631 on my caller ID. That's you know Suffolk County, Long Island. He said, uh, Father, this is Paul Tuff. I said, get out of here. Who is this? And he said, no, I heard about Arupe College. This is really Paul Tuff. So I said, well, this is really Paul Tuff. You owe me because I've sold so many of your books, Paul Tuff. <laughs> He's now writing a new book, book about uh, post-secondary ed, and Arupe will be in that. Um, he also wrote a column in the New York Times, or a magazine piece for the Sunday Magazine in May of 2014, called Who Gets to Graduate? And it was really in that article that I became aware of one of our main themes and goals at Arupe, the culture of belonging. You know, if you are a first-gen student, if you're from a low-income background and you're going to a prestigious university, you often feel like you don't belong here. If you are a, a person of color and you're attending a university that is primarily white, again, you feel like you don't belong here. And so Paul Tuff really emphasizes inculcating the culture of belonging. He also talks about the work of Angela Duckworth and Grit, her book is a bestseller now, as well as Martin Seligman from Penn and his work on resilience. And then finally, Carol Dweck's work. Carol Dweck is at Stanford, and she talks about growth mindset. So, so many of our students, again, they feel like they don't belong in a private institution. They, they don't belong in higher ed. And, you know, they feel like their intelligence is fixed. You know, so often we'll hear from students, well, I'm not a good student, or I'm not a math person. And we usually say, well, maybe not yet. All right, but that's the growth mindset. So often when our students receive a paperback or a test grade and they failed or it's a sea of red in their paper, that's confirmation that they don't belong. 
they feel that, you know, all right, well, this grade of mine, yeah, this D or this F, is permanent, it's personal, it's about me, and it's pervasive. And we try to work with our students on identifying those obstacles that prevented them from getting better grades. So we say, all right, this is a situation. It's not a great one. You failed the test. But it's specifically one test. It's not a forever thing. How do we make this transient? And what is the way, what are some ways that we can identify those obstacles that prevented you and keep away at those obstacles so the next time around it gets better for you? Uh, Paul Tuff introduced me to David Yeager. So David has worked with our faculty and staff at Arupi. He is a researcher at the um, University of Texas, Austin, uh, a real leader in this uh, culture of belonging work. So I met David Yeager uh, via an online introduction. And it turns out David Yeager's wife went to Loyola Academy, and his in-laws live on the North Shore. And so David, I said, you know, do you ever get to back to Chicago? And he said, well, you know, my in-laws really like it when um, I visit, you know, my wife's family and you know, come back to Chicago. So I said, look, David, if you help me, I'll help your marriage. All right, so get up here. <laughs> Another influence on my work has been Robert Putnam's book, Our Kids. So Putnam, the sociologist from Harvard, he wrote a Bowling Alone back in 2001 about the end of civic culture. So this book came out in April of 2015. And this is about you know, our demographic, students whose uh, parents went to college, students whose parents didn't go to college. And it's like this. If your mother and father have some college, you're on an upward trajectory. If your parents did not attend college, then things are, you know, which is more challenging for you. Two of the things that uh, Putnam talks about. First, how um, so many of um, the students whose parents didn't go to college, they don't have networks. So they're not saying, oh, OK, well, who do you know at Holy Cross? Here's the Holy Cross table. And, oh, all right, the Shriver po Poverty Law Center. You've got to meet John. Pa they don't do that. They, 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 they can't create those kinds of networks for their daughters and their sons. Also. There's a, a, a very haunting piece about family dinners. So since the 70s, when more and more of both parents were working outside of the home, the family dinner has taken a hit. In the 90s, parents with college will say, whoa, we never have dinner anymore. By God, on Sunday night, we are going to have dinner, or two nights a week. I don't care if you have hockey or if you have to work late or whatever it might be. Parents who don't have college, they may be cobbling together a couple of part-time jobs, or they just don't have the luxury of committing regularly to the family dinner, and how important those meals are for the stability of young people. All right, now this book, Come to Believe. All right, I've said, I think I've written, written more elegant emails than this book. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I wrote this during the first year of Arupe College, which was a little bit insane. Let me explain to you what this uh, title means. So this is from uh, the intro. Um, Before each board meeting for Arupe College, I celebrate mass at Baumhart Hall, the Loyola Chicago Student Residence Hall where I live, directly across the street from Arupe College. By the way, Arupe board members, we have mass next week, 3 o'clock <laughs> uh, next Tuesday. Mass is not mandatory, but many of our board members attend, as do a number of my colleagues from the, colleague, uh, from the college. On Tuesday, March 15, 2016, at such a mass during Lent, the gospel reading was from uh, St. John. The line at the end of the gospel, as he was saying this, many came to believe in him, has truly been an anchor for me in my adulthood. Later in John's gospel, when Lazarus dies, Martha says to Jesus, I have come to believe in you. And Peter, representing the apostles, says, we have come to believe in you. We have come to believe is such a powerful phrase. It does not describe a single instant because it has movement. It's fluid. It's dynamic. It's gradual. Faith, at least my experience of faith, is a process, not a lightning bolt, not a burning bush, not a eureka moment. We come to believe and we grow in our faith. I love the dynamic, and it has given me great consolation to recognize that I don't have to get it right away. Faith is a lifelong process. We are works in progress. In John's Gospel, the sin Jesus encounters most often is unbelief. In celebrating Mass with the board members, I explain that the sin I've experienced at Arupe College is that a lot of people don't believe in our students. Since they don't know the students themselves, maybe it's fair to say they don't believe in our demographic. 
those who come from a low-income background, who received okay but not great grades in high school, whose ACT scores are maybe mediocre at best, who come from, quote, the other side of the tracks. Others may feel uncomfortable with, or worse, biased against young people of color. So the sin I see all too often is that those who are established and enjoy a certain privilege don't believe in our students. In walking the halls of Arupe College, I see two students, Carlos and Omar, working on their stats homework. Another student, Stephanie, talked earlier this year about how she loves statistics. Their classmate, Carla, has talked about how she loves math and treats it like a game that takes time to master. I love their resilience. Some of our students dream about using their Arupe education to go on to Loyola. Others hope to attend an out-of-state college when they complete their associate's degree. Some speculate about going on for medical training, for an MBA, for a law degree, for a PhD. The students have come to believe in themselves. My homily with the board members that day centered on how important it is for how, for, to show the students that we believe in them, that we believe that they belong in college at Arupe, at a Jesuit college. So that's just a, a flavor of, of the book. It's on Amazon and it's being sold um, after my remarks here. Some more numbers for you about Arupe College, and this is in the book as well. So 200, all right, size matters. Uh, and so our goal is to enroll 200 in freshman year and 200 in sophomore year. This is a way of really uh, offering a high-touch program where we get to know these students, where we can approach them holistically. This is really critical. Our faculty serve as advisors. So remember what I said before that the advising, you'll meet with one, your uh, advisor once during the entire time you're enrolled. At Arupe, you meet with your advisor six times a semester, you know, either in a group setting or at least twice individually. But then, let's say your advisor is also your philosophy professor. So you see her twice a week. And maybe you see uh, your statistics, uh, she sees your statistics professor, and so she's talking to him. There's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide for our students. Our faculty members also serve as interviewers. So we had over uh, 1,400 students apply for our current freshman class. We require all of our students to interview. Our faculty members serve as the interviewers, and we're looking for the grit, the perseverance, and the resilience. We ask our students to identify an obstacle and to talk about you know, their experience of how do they deal with the, those obstacles, to see what their resilience particularly looks like. Here's my team. I'm so grateful to them for being here this morning. They really do the work. They've pioneered this work for me. So anyone who works at Arupe College, please stand up, all right, and take a bow, all right? And then here's our board uh, members. So Bill Lynch is here from uh, Wintrust. Bill is our board chair, our, fe our fearless leader. Uh, just something about our board. Um, so the Association of Governing Boards has identified that most college or university boards, they're 30% female and 10% uh, people of color. The Arupe board is 45% women and 70% people of color. So I, again, I ask all of our board members who are present to please stand. Thank you for your leadership at Arupe College. So many of our board members were with us for this very special day. So here's church and state. President Preckwinkle of Cook County uh, was our speaker at our first graduation last month. And then, of course, Cardinal Supich offered our uh, invocation. This was really a beautiful day. A really extraordinary, our, our first graduation with these students. I just can't say enough about this. So remember I did say that 5% of those enrolled in two-year colleges in the US graduate in two years. Our very first class, 52% completed their degrees in two years, not 5%. Remember I said, yeah, for them. Twenty-eight percent of our uh, uh, nationally, twenty-eight percent of the students graduate in three years who attend two-year colleges. So we are looking at seventy-three percent uh, completing their associate's degree in three years. And remember, no debt. 
The goal is that these students take out no loans, that uh, their tuition is covered except for their contributions, and then some of them receive scholarships if they can't afford that. So this is really such a great new, uh, story. I'm, I'm biased, obviously, for higher education. Our students come to us with uh, GPAs of 2.7, 2.8. The graduating class, the average GPA was a 3.1. So what does it cost to run this through Bay College? It's $6 million a year. That's our budget. If st students bring in uh, Pell and MAP grants, that's $4.5 million that is covered by the feds and the state. And then we fundraise for our summer enrichment program. This is orientation. So again, building community. Our students begin with an off-site retreat at Loyola's Retreat and Ecology Campus in Woodstock, Illinois. They meet their advisors, they meet each other. Uh, and this is not rocket science, but all the research shows if there's a solid orientation, retention rates go up and we're contributing to that body of knowledge. So the cost per student is $590 for like a week plus of orientation. Our meal program. So we offer our students uh, breakfast and lunch every day that there are classes, and uh, it's about $1,000 per student. Many of our students come to us with uh, food insecurities. All of our students receive computers, laptops, so that there's not this inconsistency. I'm doing my homework on my smartphone, and she's doing her homework on a tablet, and someone else doesn't have a computer at all, that, that kind of a thing. And then any of you who are parents, you know, I'm looking at you, Joe, so the college tours, you know, your daughter or son is in high school and you're driving all around. So our students haven't done that. And when they're looking at, you know, many of them want to continue on at Loyola, but some are looking at other options. So our, our college transfer counselor is here and she's taken our students to look at schools in Wisconsin, in Missouri, in Indiana, as well as around Illinois. And then finally, for those students, remember I said 20% of our students are undocumented. So we provide scholarships, we try to find scholarships for students who are not eligible for Pell Grants and for MAP Grants. Some data here on the undocumented. Just so that you know, 37% of the students who are on our Dean's List with a GPA of 3.5 or higher, they're the undocumented. All of the 4.0 GPAs in the sophomore class that just graduated, they're the undocumented. Most of our student government students are undocumented. These are not bad hombres. So, uh, <laughs> and I'm very grateful for the extraordinary gift from Kathy and John Schreiber that was announced last month, supporting undocumented students to attend Arupe, creating an endowment for future undocumented students to attend Arupe, and then uh, creating opportunities and supporting students to continue their educations on at Loyola. John is the vice chair of the board of trustees at Loyola and a Loyola alum. You know, our lead gift was from the McCormick Foundation, uh, and that really gave us so much credibility. And then she's embarrassed, but also contributing to students who want to continue their Jesuit education at Loyola. Judy Scully's with us today, and she and her late husband, Joe, made an extraordinary gift to Arupe and Loyola University. So many thanks. So the Wintrust people are sitting in the back. They're the good Catholics. Uh, uh, and um, Wintrust really made a space available for us. It's the Wintrust Student Commons that just opened. And again, creating that culture of belonging. Uh, this just began, you know, before this was uh, the law school, it was a lecture hall, and it has really become a, a great place for our students to congregate. So I'm so grateful to Wintrust, to Bill Lynch, and to Ed Waymer and everyone for supporting our work. All right? So to paraphrase my uh, book, you know, I'm very grateful. Thank you for coming to the City Club today. Thank you for believing in the work and in the students at Arupe College. And I think it's time for questions and answers. All right? Okay, okay. Thank you very much, Father Katsouros. You could see by the reaction. What you're doing is an incredible job. And um, we appreciate that. We expect you to come back next year with a progress report as well. Anyhow, we now have time for a few uh, 
questions? Oh, here we go. This is from uh, Preston Kendall, who's with Cristo Ray, St. Martin College Prep. You know him, huh? He's on our board. <laughs> Did you go over this with him beforehand? <laughs> I, no, I hope not. <laughs> Butterfield 8, huh? Okay. <laughs> the financial model for Rupe College is intriguing. How has the state's budget crisis impacted the model and students? And do you have concerns going forward? Well, yeah, so certainly uh, the MAP crisis very much affected us uh, at Arupe, at Loyola, and really throughout higher education. You know, uh, MAP is an important part of our financial model because the large majority of our students qualify for federal and state aid, and without that MAP money, you know, it was a real nail biter. We were able to cover it through fundraising and also, also mo most importantly, because Loyola University had a cushion. So many other higher ed institutions don't enjoy that cushion. The cushion can't last forever. We're glad that uh, Springfield came to its senses. We're very grateful to our board member, Susanna Mendoza, and for other voices of reason uh, about the budget. But really, this is a crisis for the state of Illinois and for higher education in Illinois. If we lose these young people, if there's a brain drain, and we're already seeing this with some other less resourced universities than Loyola University, what happens to our city and to our state? So, uh, you know, I hope that this is uh, a permanent, but one never knows with, with uh, Springfield. Thanks, Preston. Thank you. Um, two questions that are very similar. Uh, Fred O'Connor from Northwestern Mutual and Miles Mendoza from One Chance, Illinois. How will the tax credit scholarships impact Jesuit K-12 education in Illinois? And will the tuition tax credit provide more quote-unquote freedom for students? Yeah. Okay. So I am no longer in the K-12 arena. That said, I guess my feeling is that we want our students and all students to have more choices, to have more options. Everyone wants that for their daughter or son, for the young people in their communities. And so, you know, I just have to echo Cardinal Supich's support for this because it does allow families to make choices for their children to uh, opt for a, for a Catholic education, in our case, or for a Jesuit education. Thank you. Um, this is from your board member, Comptroller, and Crime Stopper. <laughs> All right. Get certain liberties when you're the chair, you know. Um, Susanna Mendoza. Could you name some universities that graduates, that students are going to, such as Georgetown, etc. No, <laughs> okay. she names a Catholic university. Yeah, there of you course. go. All right, so the students on the cover of this book. Uh, so Kudmir is uh, transferred to Georgetown University, uh, thriving there. Jackie is in a nursing program at University of Wisconsin Madison. Jante is still with us. Uh, Abby is on a full scholarship at Loyola University of Chicago. And uh, Luam is, has followed um, one of our pioneers at Arupe College, uh, Derek Brinkley, our first admissions director. Luam is at Columbia College here in uh, 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 Chicago. So a great range of destinations for our students. I'm, well, I'm grateful to the Jesuit schools, along with Georgetown, we have students who are the vast majority at Loyola, but also at Regis University in Denver, and Joanne Rooney and I are both trustees there, and Loyola University in uh, New Orleans. Yeah. Great. Uh, Father, you mentioned that you had 1,400 applications for the uh, 200 slots. In light of the publicity that Arupe has been receiving, the support of the Cardinal, other members of the Chicago community, your soon-to-be bestseller book, if it's not there already. Remember, we have copies of this outside, and pick some up. Um, what if... How many people do you think will apply for the next class and so forth? Yeah, it's been growing. I mean, our first year, before we even had a program up and running, we had over 600 applications. So in two years' time, we've, we've more than doubled. Um, so I, I do think that, I mean, the um, CPS, charter, and Catholic school communities are um, 
onto us. There are, there are students who are coming back to their alma maters, to their high schools, talking about the supports that they're receiving and the positive experiences that, uh, that they are receiving. And, you know, really our hope is that, um, and one of the reasons why I did write the book, is that Arupe is replicated. You know, this uh, is great for the city of Chicago, but if it works here, can it work in Milwaukee? Can it work in St. Louis? Can it work in the Bronx? Can it work in San Jose? That is the goal. And so, you know, uh, Joanne and I spend a lot of time talking to other leaders of Jesuit schools. You know, I'm super happy to report that um, St. Thomas University, which is a Catholic university, not Jesuit, we pray for them, we feel sorry for them. Um, <laughs> They have started their version of Arupe College. They're in the Twin Cities of, of Minnesota, so they just began uh, last month. So, you know, as I said at the beginning, Nativity, there are over 50 of those middle schools now. Cristo Rey, there are over 30 of those high schools now. You know, we, it'd be great to come back to the City Club and to Maggiano's five or six or 10 years from now saying, you know, this is the beginning of a movement. Thank you, yeah. Okay, so we have a date five years from now, 10 right. years from now, okay. All right. Terrific. And um, are there other institutions in this area, um, National Lewis and others, that are thinking of developing programs similar to yours that you're aware of? Yeah, so we've been in conversation with National Lewis, and it's great to see uh, our friends from, from uh, that institution, and some of our students are actually transferring over to National Lewis as well. And uh, you know, I know that Lewis is here. Uh, Dominican is an important partner for us. One of our students is at Dominican and thriving there, uh, one of our graduates. Uh, so right now we're sort of partnering with a lot of other uh, colleges and universities. And, you know, I think what makes Arupe graduates attractive is we'll say, all right, look, we've done the first two years. They have a foundation, they've been successful, and so we would bet the bank that they will be high impact players and contributing members of the Dominican community or the DePaul community or the National Lewis community around the Chicago land area for those of our students who want to stay in, in Chicago. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, one last item, and then, a, well, I have a request from. Uh, Dr. Rooney from Loyola, uh, Father Paulson, she would like to speak to you afterwards. I have no idea what this is about. I'm very curious when someone asks to speak to a priest, okay? <laughs> <laughs> Let's give uh, Father Katsaros a big round of applause. <laughs>